desperate for hope that recovery from your eating disorder is possible, do you feel afraid, ashamed, alone, or misunderstood? Or maybe you know someone struggling, but you don't know how to help. Friend, you are in the right place. Welcome to the Recover With God podcast, where you'll hear stories of recovery, personal and professional advice, and hope that only comes from God. You are not alone. You are understood. And God is here right now to walk this journey with you. Hey there, friend. Whatever brought you here today, I believe this episode will give you hope. I'm Jamie, host of the Recover With God podcast, and today I'm here with Baylor Knott. Baylor is the founder of Everything Beautiful Ministries, such a powerful name for a ministry. I love it. Um, And I love Baylor's passion to encourage women who struggle with unmet expectations and broken dreams because we serve a faithful God who created beauty and creates beauty out of anything and everything. And that's why I'm chatting with Baylor today is so she can share her story um, and the beauty that God has created in her life. Baylor, welcome to the podcast. It's a joy to talk to you again. Thank you. I am so, so excited to be here with you today, Jamie. I met Baylor, for y'all who don't know, I met her at um, a women's retreat last year. So that's why I said talk to you again, because it's um, it's just been a little bit since we last spoke, but it was, it feels like a mini reunion. <laughs> yeah, I know. As I have um, done different things with different women that we met that weekend, I keep thinking like, oh, it was just a few weeks ago that we all met, but it's oh. been like now. Uh, somehow time has flown, but I've been so grateful for the friendships and really the encouragement and the collaborations that have grown out of um, out of that one weekend that we all spent together. Yeah, it's been incredible to see all the other women, like you said, that we've met and being on each other's podcasts or whatever they're working on. And it's it's just so cool to see how God moves and, and aligns people's lives together like that. So yeah, super exciting and glad we're doing this today. Yes, me too. I've been looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, so I love to start the podcast with a question about zeal. Zeal is one of my favorite words. So if anyone's listening and you've heard multiple episodes at this point, you know the drill. Um, my definition of zeal is living with a passionate pursuit of a purpose. I love alliteration as well, in case you can't tell. So I love to ask all my guests, what does living with zeal look like in your life right now? So the retired English teacher in me loves that you pointed out the alliteration that makes my English teacher heart flutter. (laughs) Uh, For me, as I was thinking about this, I really feel like living with zeal is living with your eyes up instead of down. I think a lot of times it is so easy uh, in whatever season of life you're in, maybe especially for women to just kind of like head down, go forward, get through everything that is on my list so that I can make it through the through the day, right? Get to the end of the day. But I think if we can lift our eyes up and instead of looking down at everything we have to do, if we can look up and out at the world around us, then we are going to find these opportunities that God has placed in front of us for us to interact with others um, and, and share his love and share his glory. And so for me, that's what it is, is that that living on purpose, what it really looks like for me is looking for opportunity right? Look, where are the opportunities that God is placing in front of me where I can be an encouragement to someone else, where I can potentially love someone else well and maybe point them to Jesus as a result of that. That's so good. I I love that you bring other people into it. Um, as you know, living with zeal can obviously be an individual thing, but it really does. I agree for myself as well, that it's so great when you're living with zeal for a purpose that involves helping other people and yeah. and sharing God's love and pointing people to him. So that's, uh, that's a great way of, of just thinking, like looking up, I love, like just having like that simple reminder too. Yeah. And I think, think slowing up. down, I think slowing mm-hmm. down is a big part of that. You know, if you're like me and you're kind of like a type A, like got to go, got to get it done. It's really easy to just be like, as soon as I get everything done on my list, then I can slow down. Well, that day is never going to come. Right. So, so we need to to practice the art of slowing down so that we can look up now. Two good reminders, everybody slow down, look up. I I need that too, because I'm definitely that way. Um, there's always something more to add, but you feel like I'll get there, sure. get there and then I can rest. <laughs> yeah, nope. we're not, we're not going to get there. 
We're not going to get there. We just need to live in the moment that we're in. <laughs> mm -hmm. We need Jesus. <laughs> um, all right. Well, um, reason, you know, we're here today is to hear your story. And so I'd love to open it up to you to share whatever you'd like to share with the listeners. Yeah. So my, my name is Baylor and I live in Birmingham right now with my husband and our three kids. And I uh, was really blessed by God to grow up in a Christian home. I cannot remember a time when I did not know Jesus, went to a Christian school, really involved in church. Um, and as a young kid, really developed an affinity for following the rules. I find a lot of safety in following the rules. Part of me is like, well, they must be there for a reason. Somebody who, who came before me, who knew more than I did, put these rules into practice. And so the safest thing for me to do is to follow them. And um, that made me a really compliant child. Um, you know, the, the pleasure to have in class on the elementary school report yep. card. Uh, that was definitely me. And over time, I think, you know, that kind of, as I got older, you know, out of elementary school and into middle school, that kind of morphed into something else, into um, a desire to be perfect in every way, right? If I can make good grades and I can follow the rules and I can be like pretty decent at sports or extracurricular activities and I can be respectful and I can make everybody proud of me, then, then I will be good enough. Right. And then I'll be, you know, worthy of, of being loved. And uh, it was around the end of junior high school, eighth grade that, um, that really started to take a turn into something else because I uh, was getting, I don't know if bullied is the right word. It probably is. Um, picked on at school by some boys um, for the way that I looked. And I felt like, oh, okay, I need that's something I need to fix. You know, I'm I'm making good grades, I'm following the rules. My mom and dad are proud of me, but this is a problem area. What can I do to make it better? Right. Mm -hmm. To improve on it, you know, and I I'm five nine and I've been five nine since I was in about the sixth grade. Oh, so wow. I was already like really naturally self-conscious mm -hmm. about my appearance because I was like a head and shoulders above everyone else in, in the early oh. years of middle school. Um and so when I started, you know, getting these comments about my appearance, they were they landed. They mm -hmm. hit their mark and I um despite having a relationship with Jesus, I took matters into my own hands. And that is when my really complicated journey uh, with food and with eating began. And it is something that I battled um, probably, I would say until my freshman year of college, I would say was when I finally, not I finally, God finally um, broke me free from that. And I remember thinking during those years, about seven years, that um, that I would always be this way. Mm -hmm. That I would never, um, I would never be different. I I have a distinct memory of sitting on my bed at my parents' house when I was seventeen, crying and thinking, "I'm going to be an eighty-five-year-old woman mm -hmm. who still struggles with this." And I was like, "God, this cannot." B, this cannot be it, but I couldn't at that time, um, I couldn't see a way out, mm -hmm. I couldn't see a way out. And, you know, I look, I go, go visit my, my parents. They still live in a house that I grew up in. And I go and I look at like all the photos they have of me from that time in my life. And I look at them and I'm just like, oh, you sweet thing. If only, if only you knew, right. If, if yeah. only you were able to really see where your value was coming from, mm -hmm. you know, and that there, there wasn't anything that you ever could have done, um, or not done to, yeah. to make yourself more valuable because God assigned you your worth, you know, mm -hmm. on the, the day that you were born, you know, before you were born, if, you know, mm -hmm. according to scripture. and, um, and I, I wish sometimes that I could go back and undo it all, but I will say I learned so much about the power, the sheer mm. power of God, because, you know, if you Baylor 20 years ago, 15 years ago, would not, would not have been able to say, I really think one day I'll be free from this. Mm. You know, Baylor 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 year old Baylor would have said, this is just part of who I am. 
and I, I don't think I'll ever be different. But what I saw was God's power in his ability to break his children free from strongholds. And, and, um, and I, I was talking to someone about this just the other day. I said, the only time that I really even think about this part of my life is when I'm having a conversation like this one, hmm. right? That, yes. that that is the extent to which God um, worked a saving miracle yeah. in my life. And it, you know, I know if you're listening to this right now, you might be like, oh, well, that's all well and good for her. But I want you to know, like, I too, at that time would have looked at someone and been like, oh, well, that's all well and good for her, but that will never be me. You know, there wasn't a, there's not a, a reason that I, there's not a specific strength that I possess, right. That resulted yeah. in full recovery. There's not a, a talent that I have. I'm not just really, really good at self-discipline. You know, I, I am just really, really loved by a God who is able to overcome anything and everything. And, yeah. um, it's something that I never thought would have been possible, but it's something that I have walked through and now know that it is in fact possible, mm -hmm. you know, that God can break us free. It, there is so much power in that. I mean, number one, going back to your story of being in middle school and, you know, hearing those messages from other kids and, you know, that's the enemy, even back when we're young, you know, the enemy mm -hmm. is speaking lies to us through other people. And, and it's hard at that age to know how to process that, right? I mean, I think that's where a lot of, you know, I don't, any other people listening now that maybe that's how your story started of, you know, being young and hearing someone else say something negative to you, not that it started in your own head. And, you know, if that happened, like, that's the enemy, that is not the truth. And so, you know, it's understandable that Unfortunately, it happens a lot that way where you just, you don't know how to process it. And then you go to like, I need to change my appearance. And then right. of course, society has so many messages out there of how to do that, right? How to do it yeah. the, the the cultural way and not, not even like focusing on God and who he made us to be. So I, and yeah, I definitely understand being in that point where you think this is just going to be my life. This is how yeah. I'm going to be for, you know, like you said, till you're 85 or however old and that was, that was me as well. And so I just, I do appreciate that you realize that at, at a much younger age than I did. Um, and hopefully, at, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of different ages of people listening now, but wherever you're at, whatever age, mm -hmm. whether you are in college, whether you are, I was in my thirties when I finally realized that mm -hmm. the, that was the mm -hmm. truth. So it doesn't matter when, um, God is always ready mm -hmm. when we are ready to, to come to him with, um, you know, with the truth or wanting to hear the truth from him and, and, yeah. and get that freedom because the freedom is always available. And I especially love that you can say that you, you don't really think about it unless you're having these random conversations mm -hmm. about your past. And I think that's also something where, yeah, most people might think that's impossible, but it's, it's truly yeah. not. And, and obviously for me, like my ministry is to talk about this. So I do yeah, think about it a lot, but more from a, you know, a perspective of what I did learn from it. But yeah, to, yeah. to like, step away and, and not have to focus on that or not think like this is still ruling my life, that there mm -hmm. is freedom available. So your story has so much power and, and just speaking through the power of God in your life. I thank you so much for sharing. And was there a specific turning point that you remember in your journey with recovery where you thought, you know what, like, Nope. I need God. I need to go to him. I need to change what's mm -hmm. happening. I got to, it was my sophomore year of high school. Um, and I was so tired. That's really what it was. I was so, you know, a 16 year old should not be exhausted. <laughs> you no. know, and I was so tired because when you're, when you're in it, right. When you're, when, when, when disordered eating has you in its clutches and you're trying to hide it, you are living essentially two separate lives, right? And so you're trying to present yourself as your normal everyday self to the people around you. Meanwhile, behind the curtain, there's kind of this whole other version of oh, you, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. it's, I remember I, I was even talking to my husband in preparation for talking to you today. I said, you know, it's, I was just like kind of reflecting on all the work that God has done in my heart in this over the years. And I said, you know, I remember 
a time in my life when there was not literally, if I was awake, there was not one minute that went by that I wasn't thinking about it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, should I change it? Would I look thinner if I changed the way I was sitting? Right. If I didn't, like, if my arm was positioned a different way, would I look more, you know, co- constant, 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 just yeah. little. And I was a sophomore in high school and I was so tired. I was, and I didn't know what to do. And, and God gave me two incredible parents. And I went to my dad and I said, dad, I have to tell you something and I don't want to tell you. And, and I don't want you to tell mom. <laughs> right. That's a great opener. To right. He's like, I'm what sure are all the things like, going oh, no. through his head, right? <laughs> what did she do? <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? And and I told him, and I know, I know it broke his heart. Um, and his first response was such compassion, such and like what a mm-hmm. gift that is to be received, especially your dad, you know, yeah. that it's compassion and not like, oh, you're blowing it out of proportion, or oh, there's nothing wrong with, you know, taking like watching your weight or whatever. Um, he just met me with such compassion. And then he said, but we have to tell your mother. Oh, of course. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) Which now that I am a mother, I'm like, that was totally the right decision. (laughs) Totally Mm -hmm. the right decision. Um, and so we did, and that was such a hard conversation, but once they knew, um, it was really them who were like, okay. Cause I was not at a point where I was like, I am ready to grab this by the horns and defeat it. I was like, right. I'm so tired. I, I need help. I need help. And I, I don't know what to do. And so my mom was the one, she was making the appointments and mm-hmm. finding the counselor. And I don't like that one. All right, I'm going to find you another one. And then she found me another one. And I'm like, well, I don't like that one. Either. You know, cause I was 16. Mm-hmm. And, stuff. Right. Um, and finally she said, okay, because we had tried a couple different counselors and I was, you know, one I hated, the other one I went to for a little while and like nothing was working. And she was like, well, who do you want to talk to about this? And I said, I want to talk to Roger, who was my pastor, my childhood okay. pastor. I said, that is who I want to talk to. Mm-hmm. And my mom was the youth director at our church at the time. And she said, all right. And she plopped me down in his office and I met with him. I don't even know how long for how long, um, but on a regular basis for months. And he, you know, he knew me, he Mm -hmm. already already knew me and he already loved me um, and loved my family and was so invested in me and truly believed like Baylor, this is not what God has for you. Mm -hmm. This is not what he created you for there is more for you and he can get you there. And it took a long time, but little like inch by inch, it felt like it was me and Roger Watts and the Lord. And we crawled our way out of that hole together. And I think for me, that speaks volumes to the power of the church in our lives. I know people, there are people who have experienced hurt from church, but if you find if you find a good, faithful, God honoring church, Mm -hmm. you just plant yourself right there and you don't move because there are people in that building who love Jesus and love you yeah, and know that Jesus created you. God created you for more, more than this. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was for me, it was not that I, you know, yanked myself out of trouble by my own strength. Not at all. It was my parents. Um, and then it was my pastor. And I yeah. always say, I owe Roger Watts my life because oh. he, he loved me enough to stick by me through all the ugly. That's, I've never actually heard anyone say they talk to their pastor um, in recovery. And I think that's so beautiful because a couple of things that stuck out when you said he knew you. And mm-hmm. I think um, when I was in my recovery, I did see a counselor when, and I did not, I just didn't. Like I, I saw her for a while and I didn't feel like it helped, but I, number one, I wasn't ready, but also I didn't like, she didn't know me. She didn't know. She'd never even been had any sort of before. So there was like a lot of things where I was like, I just don't feel like this connection. Right. And so number one, like the fact that you kind of grew up and he knew you, that's so, that's so amazing that um, you had that connection with yeah. your pastor and that he wanted to invest in you and you felt like you could trust him. 
you know, yeah. really. Um, yeah. And then also I on to officiate my wedding. Oh, that's yeah. so special so, too. Beautiful. Like I was standing up there as he was talking and I was thinking like, this guy has done more for me than he will ever. I mean, and he's older than my parents, you know, but yeah. he has done so much for me in the name mm -hmm. of Jesus that I would never be able to thank him if I lived a hundred years. Oh, well, props to Roger too, because I can't imagine most, you know, male pastors have had a ton of experience with eating disorders or even knowing how to speak about them. So I feel like I can only imagine he must have had a lot of, had to do a lot of like going to yeah. God himself and like soul searching and like like digging through the Bible, of like, how do I, mm -hmm. you know, how do I help you? And, and so, you know, that's just probably a powerful thing for him too to like grow with God in a totally different way that, mm -hmm. you know, he maybe wasn't used to. So that's, that's so neat, you know, just for both of you to have that, that relationship mm -hmm. and, and like him to just take that on as, as probably a, a big challenge to you of like, um, okay, yeah, let's figure it yeah. out together. <laughs> I can imagine if my mom called him and was like, listen, my daughter is coming to you. And this is why he was probably like, uh oh, <laughs> That's he, did he did it. I mean, and he did it faithfully. And I'm so grateful. Mm, go Roger. Um, so your relationship with God during that time, how would you say it, it changed? You know, I think, and this is a lesson that God has me learning over and over, <laughs> even into adulthood is I thought like, if I can just check all these like good Christian girl boxes for God, yeah. then um, then he'll love me, right? If I can be good enough in all these ways. And this was a real, God used this opportunity. And this is really a lot of, this is Roger coming out, right? This is a lot of what he and I spent time talking about is that we do not do anything or fail to do anything that increases our value in God's eyes. Mm -hmm. We do not do anything that makes him love us more. And we do not fail to do anything that makes him love us less, mm -hmm. you know, and that God loves us because we belong to him. And, you know, moving toward healing, that was a big part of it because I, as, as that little kid rule follower, like, want my teachers to like me. I want, you know, all the adults in my life to approve of me. It's really easy. I think when you are seeking that approval from authority figures as a kid to have that translate into something else as you get older and with a, maybe without even realizing it, it turns into, I'm going to seek approval from God. And if mm -hmm. I can just do all these things and look all these ways, then God will be like her. She is my favorite. <laughs> she is my, like, loved my anointed one or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever you want to ascribe yeah. to. Um, and I think for me, it a big part of my relation, how my relationship with God shifted in this, at this point in my life was a big lesson in the fact that God is not transactional, mm -hmm. um, that his love for us is sincere and pure and cannot be bought, sold or changed in, in any kind of way. And I think I learned a lot about the, the steadfastness. That's one of my favorite words about God, mm -hmm. the steadfastness of God that, because man, let me tell you what, if anybody deserved to be walked away from, it was me in those, in those years, you know, because I was just looking everywhere, but at him for, for, for value and for worth. And he just refused to let me go. He just refused to let me go. And, um, I'm so grateful and I think it, it just, I, it's very humbling to think that the God of the entire universe would be willing to stick by me right. through, through something like mm -hmm. that. And so I think, um, my relationship with God as a result of this grew in its depth in its sincerity and its authenticity, um, and in its, um, security. Mm -hmm. I like going back to the zeal question at the beginning when you were saying you were looking everywhere but up. It just made me yeah. think of your answer there. <laughs> you know, it's just like, yeah, um, you know, that's just that's the answer to everything, right? Just look up, and yeah. um, he's there. And you're right; he does not give up on us. And I am so thankful for that. I think in my own journey, 
one of the things I've held on to is just like the power of his grace in that, in that way. And growing up Mm -hmm. as a Christian as well, and hearing that word grace and thinking in my head, I know what grace means, but not really fully understanding until you experience it at that level with God, where you're like, yeah, you could have walked away from me. I didn't deserve any of this. I still don't deserve any of this. And yet there he was, there he is every single day walking Mm -hmm. beside us and saying, you're still, you're still worthy to me, no matter where you're at today Mm -hmm. and no matter where you're at tomorrow. And we can have this conversation every day for the rest of your life. And I will always still be here for you. And, um, you know, and even you saying like, he's still kind of teaching or reminding you of certain lessons that you've you've learned Mm -hmm. over the years. It's, I think that's such a great thing to point out because as I'm, I'm with you on like the the following the rules and checking the boxes, I'm Mm -hmm. that person too. And I think there is still that tendency to like always want to go back in that direction of, of thinking, you know, I've learned this, I'm good. The box is checked off and God will be like, "Mm, no, I don't think you learn, you know, you need, you need to learn that again. Like, let's go back and talk about that again. Mm -hmm. You understand it in your head, but we're all, you know, that's just, that's just the nature of our, our humanness. And, And God is just always you know, lovingly, gently, the Holy Spirit's like mm-hmm. right there saying, Hey, you you know, remember that? Yep. So right. we you know, great. Before. <laughs> right. We did. We did. We're going to talk about it again and it'll be fine, but we're, you know, we need to talk about it again. So yeah, you know, God is such a good father. And I think those are all really great, um, great aspects to share about God and who he is and that relationship that we can mm-hmm. have with him. So it's just like so beautiful. Um, was there anything else I would say? I know you had talked about the beginning of thinking you would never have a life apart from like disordered yeah. eating, eating disorder. And so after you did recover, like how do you feel your life changed? Or like was there anything that surprised you or um anything you want to share there? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, you don't realize how much of your life something takes up until you're not doing it anymore. Right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so oh yeah. I think, you know, the um freedom that has come like freedom of thought even um to not like oh I don't have that's not on my mind it's not something that I think about now I I want you to hear me say that that is not like this is not me saying I never look in the mirror and go hmm you know like for sure that that definitely still happens where I'll put something aired gosh this was like a year and a half ago at this point um my husband and I were on a trip for our wedding anniversary Mm -hmm. And uh, it was our 15th wedding anniversary. Very exciting. Yeah. And uh, we had gone, like I said, we live in Birmingham. And so we had gone just down to the Gulf Coast for a couple of days. And before we left, I was like, I need some jean shorts. I don't have any, like everything I own is exercise clothes because I have little kids. And so I don't wear nice things (laughs) because they get destroyed. (laughs) And I was like, I need, I need some jean shorts. We're going to, our anniversary is in the summer. It's going to be hot. And so I went to Target and um, pulled some jean shorts and I was standing in the fitting room and I pulled on the size that I typically remember wearing in jean shorts and it was too small. And I was like, okay, I know, I know what's about to happen to me. (laughs) Like this is, and I was a year and a half ago, how old was I? 37, you know, a 37 year old woman standing in the target dressing room. And I'm like, stop it. This does not say anything about me. Mm -hmm. This does not say one single thing about me. I can wear these shorts and there are no like size police that are going to come up to me while I'm wearing them and be like, Ooh, not the number you had a couple summers ago. Huh? Mm -hmm. You know, there is there, this says nothing about who I am. And I've had a couple of moments like that over the last few years. And I know that I could look at those moments and be like, I cannot believe I still think about this, but God has been so gracious. And instead he has given me the perspective of, can you believe that you are okay with this? Mm -hmm. Can you believe that this doesn't bother you? Like even a couple months ago. So I, um, I love to run. I don't run like super far and I'm definitely not fast, but I enjoy I enjoy running. It's, um, mm-hmm. it's a good like mind clearing activity. Yeah. For I followed uh, your journey on that with Instagram and yeah. I'm, I'm not a runner myself. So I'm always like, yeah, like go. Cause anyone who runs like, um, 
I will cheer yeah. you on because I am not that person. Thank you. Yeah, I just, I enjoy it. It's something that I do for like my mental health, you know, it's just good yeah. for me. Um, but my other favorite way that I exercise is we belong to our local YMCA and okay. I grew up doing um, ballet and some competitive dance. And so I go to Zoom. Yes, it's very, very exciting. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. fun. <laughs> All of us getting our Beyonce on at the local yeah. YMCA. You know, you can imagine a bunch of like suburban middle-aged women in there. It but it's fun. fun. I love it. And on this particular day, a dear friend of mine was teaching the Zumba class. So I'd gone for like a short little run. So I'm like, I'm not going to run far because I want to go to Zumba. And I had gotten really hot on my run because it was hot outside. And I run in shorts, but I have only ever Zumba'd in pants, like leggings. And I was so sweaty. And I was like, I think that if I try to put on exercise leggings, it's going to be like a toddler trying to put on a wet bathing suit. Uh, Like it's just not going to, it's going to be gross. It's not going to happen. And I was like, can I, can I go to Zumba in shorts? Can I do that? Is that, is it physically humanly possible? I was like, well, those are my choices. I can either go to Zumba in shorts or I can skip my favorite class of the entire week. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to Zumba in shorts. And I went and it was great. And I had so much fun and nobody like busted up in there and was like, excuse me, you there in the shorts. No, no, you can't wear that in Mm -hmm. here. You don't, you're not thin enough to wear that in here. No, nothing like that happened. I had a great time. And it was another one of those reminders, like the dressing room at Target, where I was like, wow, like if you had told me 20 years ago, Baylor, one day when you are almost 40, you're going to go to a Zumba class, you're going to stand in the front row, you're going to wear running shorts. I would have laughed you out of the room. But it was just a moment where I was like, wow, God, like you brought me this far where I did it. And I really didn't care. Like once I was in there, I didn't think about it again. Mm -hmm. And it focused on the friend. Yeah. And, And I think it moments like those, I think, you know, once you're on the other side, of a, of a struggle with, with eating and with food, these moments are going to crop up in your life where Mm -hmm. you could be like, Oh my gosh. And like, it could be a real opportunity for Satan to get in there in your ear or that very same moment, God could move you to thank him for how far he's brought you. And I think Mm -hmm. that is something that has shocked me in the years since, um, since healing. That's, that's a that's such a great thing to bring up, I think, to anyone who's still struggling, where you think, number one, when you said you you have this idea that you're never gonna have those thoughts again, right? And mm-hmm. I think knowing just knowing like they will still pop up, but it's all about your reaction to them. And if you can like you're building that reflex of how you respond to it and and knowing the truth versus dwelling in the mm-hmm. the lies that the devil wants you to hear. And yeah. so I think that's just very important, number one, to call out that it's going to happen. And that doesn't mean you're failing when you have that moment or that thought that does not mean failure whatsoever in your life that you're like, Oh no, like I've, I've lost everything I've learned. No, it's just, that's just life. Yeah. Um, as you say, I do want to clarify, I know I said earlier, like, Oh, I never really think about it unless I'm having this kind of conversation. Yeah. Um, and then I tell you these stories about the dressing room in the Zuma class. It is, there are these moments when it pops in and I'm like, Oh, nope. You don't get to come in mm-hmm. here. You know, when so, I say I don't think about it, what I mean is I don't sit around and dwell on it. Yeah. And I don't, you know, put on my clothes in the morning and then spend forever looking at myself and thinking like, this is not good. This is yeah. not good. It's the, the pattern of thought yeah. has changed. I don't, when I don't think about, when I say I don't think about it anymore, I don't think about it in the way that I thought about it for years and years mm-hmm. and years of my life. And that is a testament to the power of God alone. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's, thanks for clarifying, but I, that makes so much sense of just, you know, you're not, yeah, you're not dwelling. There's a huge difference between having a big thought on and then letting it go. Uh, so I think just thank you for bringing up just dressing rooms in general. I think that's, that's something we can all relate to, right? Yeah. Anyone listening, you've been in a dressing room and you've probably not been happy at some point about what the things looked like. And so just having those, those thoughts of, like you said, there's the size, it's not on the outside of your clothes. And even if it was, who cares? Like, even if it is like, right, exactly. It's a number I read something that said like your gene size is the least interesting thing about you. I was right, like, well, it is. 
Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, yeah, it's literally just a number and honest and yeah, it means nothing. And it's, it is very freeing to be able to go in and just put on the size that fits and think, Mm -hmm. okay, I've got clothes that fit me and I can be happy with that. So, um, no, I think that's a great story to, to add. Thank you for sharing that. Um, now I know you said that your parents were really helpful and obviously your pastor too. Um, what would you say to, what advice would you give to a friend or family member of someone struggling? Um, anything that like maybe your family did for you that really helped, um, or didn't help? Um, what would you say to them? This is such a tricky thing, right? Especially if you, you've got somebody in your life who is struggling and it's not a struggle that you yourself have had, right? It is so easy to say the wrong thing. (laughs) So easy to say the wrong thing. Um, and this is certain, like my voice is not monolith by any stretch of the imagination. Right. You know, I think you could get 10 different ladies up here and we'd say 10 different answers to this yep. question. Um, but I do think um, not rushing someone, hmm. I think is huge because until you are ready to be different than you currently are, it's not going to happen, right? It's not something that can be forced on a person. Um, I think I would also say, and this is true. This was true for me. Asking direct questions is not necessarily helpful. Hmm. Um, like if you are struggling with not eating saying, Oh, well, did you eat anything? Did you eat anything? That is not helpful. Or if you are struggling with purging, like, why did you just go to the bath? Things like that are not, they're not going to get you where you go. Um, I think things that are helpful. I love you. Mm-hmm. I love you so much. And I love you because of who you are. And that is it. That's, that's, that's the driving force behind my love for you. I am here for you. I am not going to judge you. You can tell me anything you want. And I am here. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going anywhere. I think more than anything, you're, Um, coming back to that word steadfastness, your steadfastness in that person's life. I think learning that I'm not going to scare you away is huge for, um, for people, for women, especially who are, who are struggling in this way. And I think being willing, you know, one of the words that's used over and over in the Bible to describe God um, is slow to anger. And the word, it, it actually translates as patient, long-suffering. <laughs> and I think <laughs> nice. if you are willing to be patient and long-suffering with the person in your life who is struggling, I think that will speak more loudly than any combination of words you could ever hope to put together. Yeah. Because it is very isolating. We talked about that before, right? Like the persona yeah. that putting out there oh, yeah. and the real me behind the curtain and letting someone behind the curtain is terrifying. And so if yes. I let you in and you stay, that is huge. Yeah. That's a great way of putting it. Um, cause it is terrifying. So, um, you will take, take that step if you need to tell someone, but also, mm-hmm. you know, for anyone listening, if you want to be that support person, those are, those are fantastic, uh, ways mm-hmm. to just, you know, ease into that, that conversation and that relationship. So thank you for sharing. And I want to give you a chance to share about your ministry, um, in you and your, your book and just all the things and ways that listeners can contact you and connect with you. Yeah. So, uh, like Jamie said at the beginning, my ministry, it's everything beautiful ministries. It is born out of Ecclesiastes 311, which tells us that God makes everything beautiful in its time, right? At the right time. We want it to all be beautiful today. Don't we? We want it to all be beautiful today. Like right now, let's just fix it right now. Make it pretty. Uh, But that is not the way that God operates. He does things in his time. And so that's really the heartbeat behind my entire ministry is this belief that God only writes beautiful stories in Mm -hmm. our lives. And as far as resources, I've got a free email that goes out every Wednesday that is um, a scripture and then just some words of encouragement from me that relate back to the truth that we find in God's word. Um, I also have a, um, a, a devotion subscription that goes out on Mondays called the Made Beautiful Devotion. And that is uh, a bit more, uh, I don't know, beefy. I don't like that word. That's <laughs> Party. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Nice. Um, and that is uh, like a full page devotion with application questions and then a 20 minute teaching video from me that goes out each Monday. Um, that is a subscription. Your first month is free. After that, it's $5 a month. That is fantastic. We just started a series on the Beatitudes, uh, which I am nice. absolutely loving the opening from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew yeah. 5. Um, and then last year, I put out my first book, which yeah. is still super duper <laughs> weird to say yeah. out loud. It is I crazy, call, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's wild. It's called 30 Days to Thankful, Cultivating a Grateful Heart. And this is the resource that I would most highly recommend um, of the ones that I currently offer, because what this book does, it takes you on a 30 day journey, kind of through the entire human experience. We start in Jeremiah one, verse five, where God says, before you were formed, I knew you, I set you apart, right? This, this truth that God has a purpose for each of us before we even arrive here on earth. And then we walk through 30 days of things that are true about God, true about you and true about God's word. And it kind of takes you from before birth all the way until the fact that we are going to spend eternity in the presence of God in heaven. And if if, if eating disorders are something that you are presently struggling with, or if you know somebody who is, this is a great resource because if you read the book, you will get 30 days of truth from God as it pertains to you the child that he created. And so this is a, a great, a great re resource for you to use. And then the last thing that I currently have out is an Instagram live series called everything beautiful live. It is on, on Instagram, obviously mm -hmm. the first and third Wednesday of each month at seven central. And I have different guests on Jamie is coming on soon, which yes. I'm super excited about. Me too. Uh, and that is just a, like a 30 minute conversation about a time in your life when things felt really messy or looked really chaotic, but God was still at work writing a beautiful story. I will put all of that in the show notes and, you know, Instagram, your book on Amazon, your website, and give everyone a chance to connect with you in all the places. And I'm glad you described your book so beautifully of walking through the truth, because that is such a key key thing to recovery is is yeah. focusing on the truth of god and not on the lies because we're inundated with all the lies all the time everyone is whether it's with eating disorders or just other things that the enemy wants yeah. to distract us with or or attack us in and so truth is so key and being mm -hmm. thankful for the fact that god made us i mean now to be recovered and to be talking to you today and both of us are recovered it's such a gift life is such a beautiful mm -hmm. gift to to just live in that freedom that god designed us to live in so i think anyone i know anyone listening will so much value out of that and draw closer to god so thank you so much baylor for sharing your story first of all and then for providing all these other resources and listening to god to you know go forward with your ministry, knowing that you are helping other women and living with that zeal that we talked about in the beginning. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me today, Jamie. I have really enjoyed this conversation. I think um, this, is a, this is a discussion that is so needed, right? And so relevant. And I love, you know, that you hear even at the very end, just talking about like the truth of God, right? Because the truth is that you have value because you were made in the image of God. That's the thing that 100%. makes you work. That's the thing that makes you worthy yeah. and anything else is a lie from Satan, right? That's why Jesus calls Satan the father of lies. When he lies, he, he speaks in his native tongue. It is the only way that he knows how to talk. And so when we hear those, those things, those whispers coming in our ears, we can say, nah, nope, that is not from God. And I, I'm not here for that. Yeah. Yeah. And learning how to discern that better and better as we, as we grow and as we mm -hmm. learn more about him. So, uh, yeah, I can speak about truth truth and lies all day, but I mean, it's always a good, a good topic and a good reminder. So I'm um, glad that we touched a lot on that today, but thank you so much. I'm definitely looking forward to being on your live soon and just glad that we're, um, yeah, we're able to um, just stay in touch and, and just continue just ah, shouting Jesus to everyone. Yes. <laughs> I love doing that. <laughs> yeah. It's a good way to spend the afternoon. For it sure. is. It really is. This is, yeah, I've definitely been a highlight of the day. For, so thank you, Baylor. Sure. Yes, me too. Thank you, Jamie. I appreciate it. Hey, friend. I hope this conversation encouraged you today. And if it did, please let me know by reading and reviewing the Recover With God podcast wherever you are listening. Your feedback helps others find this podcast too. 
and click that follow button so you don't miss new episodes airing every Wednesday this season. Be sure to check out the show notes for all the links and additional resources we talked about today. And don't forget, whether you need help or you want to help, all help comes from God.